And then without any further ado, uh, let me take the screen off here and let's just get to uh, uh, Ray. So, all right, Ray, looks like your mic's on. Good morning, how are you? Good morning, Tom. Great to be here and thanks for having me on as your, uh, as your guest today. Well, we're thrilled you're with us and you've got some teammates with you today, is that right, to join uh, us? I, I, I think there's some people on today, yes. I, I think you got I, Daisy's on. Is Daisy, I believe Daisy's on and Christy's on today, yeah. Daisy and Christy, and so it's great to have them on there too. So, Ray, you are a uh, renaissance man in the beauty industry. Your accomplishments come from, let's see here, uh, being a major creative force, uh, opening up a wonderful um, collection of salons in Canada, uh, distribution, you're a philanthropist. Um, I love your photography, and so you, you've worn a lot of hats in the professional beauty industry. For those of you who don't know Ray, He's been a massive contributor and also a good friend. So thanks for joining us. Pleasure. So we, um, we spent, uh, I, was, I was in a conversation with Ray yesterday and um, Ray's colleague had to walk in and say, okay, you got to be done. I felt like we were just getting warmed up after an hour actually. <laughs> um, and we covered so much ground. So my job today is to really allow Ray to share his point of view. And one of the things that jumped out at me in, in, in our time together is you talked about defining um, a normal. It's a, it's a new normal. And then you went right into the fact that the hair industry already was experiencing massive changes. So before we even get to pandemic, let's go before pandemic. And there's already massive changes. And I think you used the word that um, the pandemic is, is an accelerator, but it's also something that things create stoppages. So anyway, let's use that as the beginning of our conversation is what was going on prior to the pandemic and this whole concept of the pandemic being an accelerator. Yeah, I, uh, thanks, uh, Tom. I think that, first of all, I think, um, uh, you know, we could look at the last uh, seven, eight years within our industry and seeing quite a, a dramatic shift away from um, the traditional uh, uh, way of doing things. The way in which we were doing things seemed to be, everything seemed to be fine. We were providing great services in the salon. And, uh, and the uh, compensation system seemed to be uh, equivalent for the service provider. The values were there. And the business model itself, I think, um, uh, was a very good model. I mean, you know, the, as we all know, the, the hair industry isn't necessarily um, where people pledge a lot of money in investment to make a lot of money. It's just not what we do. If we put a lot of money and effort and passion and love into this industry, and we have a great time doing it, and of course, uh, we can make money, but it's a, it is not an industry where there is a, a lot of room for error. There's not a, an abundance of buffers in your profit lines, as you well know, and all the people on this call, I'm sure, well know. Um, so so we, we seek to create um, these wonderful environments and we want to build teams and, and we want to create experiences for people coming in that are memorable and amazing. And we did that for quite a long time, but there was a shift that was already happening. That shift was people were gravitating towards smaller environments versus the larger environments. And there was a shift for people to go to you know, rental suites or rental salon uh, to continue to be profitable as opposed to fighting um, that battle which they were uh, coming up against, which were people uh, asking for more compensation and trying to figure out how I could keep that staff in the salon and those people uh, and other people happy at the same time. So I think we were, we were seeing that gravitation um, happening and, and it was happening, I think, at a fairly rapid pace. And I think a lot of that was uh, really at, at the center of that was the digital movement. If we really want to look at what, what was causing that. I think the digital movement changed behaviors so significantly and, um, and anyone in the service industry was impacted by that. Anybody who was in the retail industry was even more impacted by that. So the digital um, experience that everyone gravitated and eventually became more comfortable with making purchases and having those experiences online really shifted how we think, how we do, what we do, when we do it, how we do it. All of that was at the center of it. And then you have, of course, COVID. A little thing that none of us can even see stops the world and makes us realize how incredibly fragile we really are. I mean, how does something we can't even see stop all of us? And, um, and in, a, in a sense, I, I often refer to it as a gift. I don't know that in our lives, we, we've, any of us have ever experienced the opportunity unless you've been 
you know, have had a crisis in your life? Have you been given the opportunity to spend time, uh, quality time, really reflecting on what you do in this life and what you're doing and, and, and what is it that you want to do? And so I think we were all given the same period to reflect together. And I think that's a consciousness shift. I think that's a global consciousness shift that we all move together in the collective and everybody comes out of it going, oh, we have, to, we have to really reassess everything here. And so we pick up a lot of where we were and those things became accelerated. So the suites became accelerated. The, the rental salon became accelerated. The smaller salons were easier to build faster, cheaper. And using digital, there was an equalizer there because people wanted to feel intimate. They want to feel intimate. They want to feel connected. Customers want to be connected to the salon. And in today's world, the smaller salons are able to do that quite successfully because they are intimate. They're local. They're usually in their neighborhood and they're part of that community. The larger salons are struggling a little bit more to stay relevant and intimate with their relationships with their guests. They have to do other things and they have other capabilities that the smaller salon can't do. You know, so they're, they're, they have to go to eventing, they have to stay connected, it's critical. Um, so that shift of the smaller salon and going to the suite was a safer environment for a lot of people who didn't want to come back to the salon. But actually, so there were people who hadn't even thought about going to a suite who were happy in their salon, but post COVID didn't feel that they had control over that environment anymore and felt more comfortable in a smaller, environment that they could control everything in. So that, that's been the acceleration. And I think we're seeing that larger, bigger salons may not be something we see again for, for quite some time. I don't, I don't see that in the immediate future. Interesting observations. I, I wrote some things down here, uh, digital being the equalizer. I think that's super powerful. It's a really great way of putting it. Um, you know, I completely relate with industry trends pre-pandemic. There was changes in the workforce. There's changes in retailing, uh, Amazon, et cetera. Uh, there's fragmentation with more business models coming in, such as specialized businesses, such as blow dry bars, et cetera. Um, so a lot of fragmentation. And of course, the workforce being a very different workforce. And this is, as well as a lot of deregulation and government related issues, at least here in the US. I forgot to mention to all of you that uh, Ray is from Canada. He's a Canadian, he's up in Toronto. So. Uh, I neglected to mention that you are at least our second contributor from Canada here. So uh, now let's uh, let's stay with the suites a little bit longer, okay? Yep. Because you unpacked that a little bit more, and you were saying that lots weren't really thinking about suites; they were happy as a team. But the suites have gotten smarter. So why don't you uh, why don't you speak to that for a moment? Yeah, I think what we, when, when the suites first started to appear, it just looked like real estate to me. It just looked like a room. It didn't look special. It didn't look unique. And it was just a value proposition on the rent being X. And a lot of people not realizing all the additional expenses that they would have went into it. And, uh, and a lot of people failed at it, obviously. Um, but it's become more sophisticated. I think uh, you're getting a lot more support, uh, a lot more concierge services, if you will, uh, by the people who own these suites. I mean, one of the one of the ones in New York that really stands out for me is called Main Space, M-A-N-E, Main Space. And they have a number of floors with these beautiful, unique spaces, which you can rent by the hour. Like you, you can go to New York and do a client, you have a special client, you can rent a suite for an hour. Uh, you can rent it by, by the day, you can rent it by the week, you can rent it by the month. So the Uber model, if you will, of renting space. And I know that that's pervasive in lots of different territories like California, for example. But it, it really, um, I think that the quality of those environments and the services, the support services has improved as it should, I guess, because that has, that's where the growth is. So follow the money, that's where it's going. And that's where a lot of people have, uh, have definitely uh, made some very, uh, very big improvements in my life. We also, uh, go ahead. We also talked about the, uh, you referred to it as the stay at home economy. Yeah and how that is um, fueling things. So let's uh, go there next for a little bit. Yeah, well, if you look at, if, you, if any of you are stock market uh, uh, investors, and I hope some of you are, except right now, we kind of say, watch out uh, for the next month or so, uh, until after the elections and maybe after we get a vaccine, which I think is a very pivotal moment in our history, is the vaccine. Um, and it looks like, uh, you know, end of year, early next year, 
we'll see that happening. I think that's a very important thing to look forward to because that um, will provide society, uh, again, a sense of security. And there will be a lot of things that will return, but a lot of things will never happen again. And so uh, small businesses, of course, uh, have been getting hurt dramatically during this period. And that's because the stay at home economy, which is booming. So Zoom as a, as a company is booming. DocuSign is booming. Uh, these companies, which are the Amazon, obviously booming. Uh, these companies are booming uh, FedEx, if you will, UPS, anything to do with delivering uh, products to your home or to business to business. What is not booming is commercial real estate. You know, anybody who has a building right now has an empty building. A lot of people will never fill those buildings again. And so they may have to repurpose those buildings. They may go to residential, who knows? Um, residential vacancies in New York is at a never before seen uh, a high. So this is a different world we live in when New York City has always been the epicenter of the world, really. So the stay at home economy um, is a big shift. I mean, sir, again, there were a lot of people that were engaged in stay at home one day a week, two days a week. There were companies that, uh, forward thinking companies that were allowing their employees to stay at home and work from home because it was a request by many people. Um, of course, now you have a whole economy built around it and people have found out that, hey, listen, this is productive. People can be at home and be very, very productive. There's Certainly, uh, um, and, and I think it's great for the environment. We don't have as many cars on the road. It's better for traffic. There are a lot of benefits to this, but um, when it comes to people looking good, <laughs> well, if they don't have a lot of Zoom calls, they don't have to be on screen a lot, and they can work from home, uh, perhaps their, their attention to their own grooming um, and their awareness of how good they have to look, uh, I think that's shifted a little bit, and I think people are are less attentive to that. I know that makeup sales, for example, have really dropped since March of this year, dramatically. Skincare, on the other hand, has grown. So it's interesting, wellness is at an all-time high, right? So we've got to shift to wellness, to yoga, to meditation, to taking care of yourself, to products that take care of your skin because people are at home so often, but also people are thinking much more consciously of protecting themselves. So when we look at products, for example, moving forward, um, you know, clean beauty is the only place to really be because if you're looking to attract the future generations, Gen Z, for example, 90% of them say they would never buy anything. It's not clean beauty. You know, you're, you know you're, if you're not in that space, and if you look at Sephora, if you look at Alta, which are the big retailers in the beauty industry and Amazon, they have expanded their clean beauty offering dramatically. So we're seeing a lot of that shifting. And so hair color which was one of the topics Tommy and I talked about yesterday, what a big shift there in hair color, for example. So people um, could hide uh, a lot better uh, on a screen than being in person, whether they, you know, they had these, this new growth. And a lot of, a lot of people um, started doing their hair at home. So they were ordering, and, and I, I mentioned this yesterday, Walmart could not keep clippers and home hair color in stock. Those were the two things, which tells us people were cutting hair at home using any step-by-step -step video that you get your hands on, and also doing your own hair color. And a lot of salons were offering hair color services, or they were, they were packaging kits and sending them to their, their clients at home. And there was a lot of controversy uh, over that, whether that was unprofessional or whether that was professional. I think it, one thing it did do was uh, it certainly kept the guests engaged. There was an interaction, there was a relationship when there could be none. So there was something that was happening there. A lot of those clients, we're very grateful that they had a hairdresser because they saw how difficult it was and what a mess they were making at home. And they're really happy to get back to the salon. But there's a whole other percentage of people who are not coming back to the salon, period. They're not coming back because, A, maybe they don't have as much money as they had before. And getting your new growth done in six weeks is expensive, it, especially if you don't have a subscription plan, which I recommend always. You know, if you've got those regular guests, put them on, a, you know, on, a, on some kind of plan that gets them in as frequent as they need to be, um, but at a, at a lesser price point. And then those people, uh, also there was another group of people who don't feel it's safe. I'm not going out. I'm not gonna be able to be in a room with a lot of people. I, even if they've got shields on and masks on and just still not there, and there's a lot of people that feel that way. And so the growth of uh, home hair color, both in the drugstore category, but then if you look at Madison Reed, or if you look at East Salon, tripling sales, and what did a lot of color technicians do that were sitting at home? They went to work for Madison Reed. They went to work for East Salon where they were doing consultations online. So that was a, 
That's probably the most significant disruptor and one of the biggest shifts in our industry that's happened as a result. And I, and I really believe that there is an opportunity there. The salon industry has to not ignore that. And they have to look at that very seriously as an opportunity, not just ignore it and say, hey, we, you know, we're just going to let Madison Reed eat our lunch. And by the way, when things return to normal, they're all coming back again. I don't think that's the truth. I think that the home economy, the new home economy is here to stay. And I think there are people that will require people coming to their home to do everything. They're not going to leave their home for an awful lot. People have become better cooks. People are doing a lot of good things at home. Uh, you know, I, I think that we have to uh, look at habits of human beings first to understand better where our opportunities and where our positioning can be. Yeah. I'm just uh, so loving this conversation and let's pause a second here and see what comments we have from you guys. What is it from Ray that's resonating with you so far? And uh, uh, what is it that um, you want to add uh, or piggyback on what he said, first of all? I disagree with me. They even disagree with me because I mean, you know, some people don't agree with that, that thinking, Tom. I think there's a lot of people that don't think that that's a good idea. But if, if we look at the behavior, it, it just like the behavior of people buying online. The, the manufacturers didn't decide to go online and bring the consumer there. The consumer went there because it was easy. And everybody wants simple, easy, fast, no friction. That's what they're looking for. That's the transaction. That's the, if we're looking to create, make magic, that's what we have to create. So that yeah. was easy. And yeah, there's, there's some tsunami level trends going on in the beauty, as you said, they were already there, but this massive acceleration. I mean, it's, and in these calls, by the way, in terms of this group, uh, you might have some people disagree, but this is a group of innovators. If people are spending the time every Wednesday to be on this call, they're serious about financial sustainability and they want this information. And um, uh, I think an area we really haven't explored much on previous calls is the whole hair color business. And, you use the word subscription. It's really interesting. And you know, one of the things I admire about you, Ray, is you're an innovator and you tend to think sort of ahead and can see what's coming based upon your observations and experience. Um, so as an innovator, if we look at the hair color part of the business and we have salons out there that know they need to stay nimble, they need to innovate. Um, and here's the thing about a trend, you can't fight a trend. Um, you can't fight a trend uh, that is um, of the magnitude of the things that we're seeing, such as the workforce and uh, fragmented salon models. So if we, let's look at hair color a little bit longer. And what would a subscription plan look like? Oh, well, I think it, what it looks like is uh, there's, a, there's multi levels of it. I think you've got to look at it. kind of a loyalty uh, program in a sense. So if you could do one, which is just a blanket, I pay this much a year and I come as many times to get my new growth done, right? With no, no max, no min, this is what it is. I come in, I, if I want to come every four weeks, I come every four, if I want to come every three weeks, I come. Well, you may want to put some limitations to how many. There are other people who I, I've seen working it through where they've been able to say, well, with our margins, if they come more frequently, we're obviously getting more top line, we're getting more money that we wouldn't have gotten. So we're getting more money, and as a result, we can offer, we can take some of that margin down and offer it back in a free service. So we might say, if she were, to, she were to come or he were to come or they were to come, you know, maybe five times or six times during the course of the year, we want them to come seven times for the same price. So it doesn't take away anything from us. It's just the dollar value of the appointment time, which you've already covered off by the, the fact that maybe they've come two or three more times than that. Sorry. So if they came five, you're trying to get them there eight, giving them one or two of them being free. So you may, you may not, in fact, in some cases, you may not necessarily even make more money. You might make the same amount of money, but have them come more frequently. When they come more frequently, they're liable to get any up service. So they might get a conditioning treatment, or they may get, or they may just buy some product. In fact, if they're in your shop, they may just pick up some extra product. But there's always a better chance of doing more for them and staying connected to them, the more frequent they are with you, and there's less possibility of them going somewhere else for all of those services. Great analogy. I'm thinking last night, my uh, son bought a car and I was sitting down with him when they, they inevitably do all the different add-ons, you know, and the one, the one that he took other than the extended warranty and all that kind of stuff, the one he took was for 
uh, oil changes. And it's basically a prepayment for oil changes, which is so smart, uh, even if it's at a discount, it gets him back to the dealership. Uh, it gets him engaged. It's the same thing. And it's the other thing is it's upfront money. So I think it's a um, very um, compelling idea. And I would really like to see from anybody on the chat screen, if they've specifically done this as it relates to some type of subscription type series as it relates to hair color, then I'll check the chat in a minute. Uh, the um, other things that we talked about is, um, uh, you already mentioned the Walmart. Uh, we talked a little, we talked quite a bit about hair color. Um, and you, you talked about a trend to these smaller salons. You touched on that at the very beginning. Uh, I'd like to spend a little bit of more time around that, okay? Sort of what you're seeing as a trend. And, and you're on the front line with this being in the, you've been in the distribution business a very long time. And so you're seeing this as a salon owner and as a distributor. So you've, you're definitely in the pulse of this. So this trend to smaller businesses, let's spend a few more minutes on that, okay? Yeah, I mean, if you look at a larger salon, I mean, just based on your build out alone, I mean, your, your costs of building out a larger salon, dollars per square foot, number of chairs, number of all the equipment, products, everything that you need, of course, you need a substantial amount of money. Most people, I mean, I, I, you know, depending on finishes and what have you, you know, you're upwards of 350,000 up to 600,000 sometimes depending on, you know, the quality of what you're doing. Um, what I'm seeing is that uh, people are moving to, uh, they're way off of Main Street. They're moving to little neighborhoods, which are not overly gentrified. In fact, a lot of these neighborhoods are saying, let's not be gentrified. Let's keep this real village atmosphere. and Let's let all the local merchants be the heroes. And so what's happening is the community is supporting those local merchants rather than bringing the big box merchandisers. And, and that's typically what happens when they get popular and you get the bigger retailers come in, but that's not happening. Retailers are afraid now anyway, because they, they're just not expanding like they used to. So it's a wonderful time for, for smaller businesses in that sense to be supported by the neighborhood. And I think what these smaller salons are able to do is they're able to build and have a rental situation, which creates a business model, which I think uh, has a very good chance for, for prosperity and, and margins in the double digit. We're talking about you know, profitability because they're not spending a lot necessarily on the build out. Uh, most of the ones that I've seen are you know, dad and dad's friends are building the stations. And, and so there's a lot of that again, that, you know, there's really humble beginnings. Um, and I, I love it, by the way. I love the story that dad gets in there and the uncle and they all work together to build because it's got love in it. And it's got something more than just the prefab, something like that. And, you know, so I, I like that. I like that energy. Um, they're able to do it for 150000 They're not buying the best lighting. They're not buying the best mirrors. Yes, they could be better, all that could be better, but they create an ambiance that's close to who they are, their personality. And then, the next part of that to be successful is, and I think a lot of them are because they're, they're quite young, they're, they're savvy when it comes to communicating what their brand is about. They're very clever about how they do it. And the messaging is very authentic. It's not you know, prefabricated, it's not purchased. It's something that they're doing, telling their story. And I think that resonates with the local community. The community wants to support that. So I think that that's why we're seeing a lot more of these smaller salons moving away from the center core and into these neighborhoods that, uh, you know, I mean, center core, may, any major city in North America is very expensive to live in anyway. So more and more people are leaving. And with COVID, of course, that's one of those accelerators. Everybody's leaving the cities for safety because it's not always safe anymore in the cities. And because they're getting much more value in a neighborhood, in a suburb, uh, where these salons are popping up. I, I see yeah. that. Yeah, to your point, the smaller businesses uh, have an opportunity to be more nimble. And there's also the opportunity for more an authentic message that's not diluted through layers and uh, lots, lots of people. And, you know, so I totally get where you're coming from on that. Now, in terms of the Chabello salons uh, and some of the things that uh, you might be doing to be proactive about the future. And you have how many locations all together? Is it five? Or? Yeah. And so four in the Toronto area, then one in uh, Vancouver. Right. Is that right? Okay. So uh, share within your comfort level, certain things going on. I know there's one that I want to bring up and that has to do with, uh, you referred to the unified look. 
and dress code. Um, so that's something new. And that might be stimulated. Well, I'll let you, I'll let you speak to that. Yeah, I, mean, you, I think where you were going is the right, the right place. And, and you know, there's a lot that's happened. Um, um, the, uh, the business uh, itself is operating close to 85% of what it was pre-COVID. Uh, and that's, of course, with uh, a lot less people. So, you know, if we really look at it, we're not feeling too bad about ourselves at this point. Um, but if we look at what our greatest opportunity was right now, I think it's the uh, um, it's culture. I think we've always been a fantastic culture, strong culture, but uh, we, we aren't necessarily feeling um, that our culture is, is uh, 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 as stable as it once was at pre-COVID. Uh, and what I mean by that is simply uh, everyone's had time to reflect. And, and, it, and it turns out that a lot of younger Hairdressers, especially in that five-year category, five, six-year category, um, which we, as salon owners, um, we've invested, we've helped build a clientele, and, and we're at a point now where the, the business relationship is at the highest benefit for both. Um, those are the ones we're finding are leaving, um, and they're leaving for 2%, 3% more commission, um, no client fees, and going to a smaller salon where they can pick their own hours, um, and, uh, um, and believe that they're going to have less, uh, a need to work less and obviously make more money. By the way, there's no one on this call, there's no one that I know that doesn't want to work less and make more money. I mean, I don't know anyone that doesn't want that deal. So it's attractive and it makes total sense. Is it the reality? Not always. It's not always the reality. In fact, leaving anywhere automatically uh, will dilute your clientele. And there's no way that you bring 100% with you, uh, with very few exceptions, perhaps. Um, so you, you're taking 2% more, obviously. You're not making more money. You're, not, you're probably going to make less money for the first year, maybe even second year. It does take time to rebuild your clientele. And, it's, and if you're only available less hours, uh, you know, this is one of those things where people say, oh, the first thing I want to do is take Saturdays off. Saturday is still is the money day. It's the best, best day of the week to be in a hair salon. If you don't work Saturdays, chances are your clients are going to go to somebody else you know, the ones that you built up because Saturday is the best day for them to come. So it, it is one of those things that I think, uh, um, you know, we're working through all of that. And I think that, um, you know, when we talk about uh, the, uh, uh, the unified look, we've, we've modified that unified look continuously to try to be relevant, you know, all black for years. And in fact, when we first started, actually we didn't because everybody wore suits and everybody dressed up to come to work. It was like, it was like fun to dress up. And, we have become a much more casual society, period, right? We're not as formal as we once were. If you look at restaurants, formal dining is, you know, is almost non-existent. We are much more casual about everything we do. And so we got to the point where we went, okay, well, we'll, we'll be black and we'll be gray and we'll be white. And you can mix those three shades together so that you can express yourself individually, but we still look somewhat of a team and, and some somewhat of a unified look. Uh, so as of last week, our team is uh, working on uh, making the announcement. Our team doesn't actually have salon for anybody know, but uh, we actually are going to uh, uh, do away with our unified look. We're going to allow everyone to, uh, to dress and express themselves as they see themselves to be. Uh, we believe that this period in life right now, especially coming out of COVID, there's a real need for people to just, you know, want to be who they are. Their, their identity is critical. And uh, we don't believe that uh, the unified look is as relevant as it once was, not in our culture. So. Yeah. Uh, what a great conversation. And I'm totally in, enthralled with this. And I'm, I'm trying to look at some of the uh, comments that came up. And uh, uh, Michelle, I might have you sort of vet some of those to see if they turn into a question. So uh, how has this affected you personally? in terms of your personal life and how you spend your time. And I think that as leaders, we need to be unapologetic to make sure that we take care of ourselves and that we're fulfilled too, which is gonna make us better leaders and more successful. So uh, how has this impacted you? You know, Tom, I, I learned a long time ago, I don't remember exactly when, but uh, I, I, I've always adhered to the, the uh, the opportunity that we have during crisis. So whenever we have a crisis, we have a very important choice. Once we acknowledge that we are in crisis, 
because there's four stages before you get there, you go to denial immediately. No, it's not really happening. <laughs> yes, it is, but no, it's not. Okay, it might be happening. Is it really happening? Yes, it is happening. And so when we get to that stage of really fully accepting, embracing that this is a crisis, we have a choice to make. And the choices that people make are usually in two different directions. Is whether, you know, there's a, a self-love reaction or, or whether there's a fear-based reaction. So if I love myself, I'm going to take this opportunity to make love to myself. In order to make love to myself, I have to do stuff that makes me better. So mind, body, spirit, I have to feed all of that. And I have an opportunity now that I didn't have. I have time to actually do that. So the first thing I did was I did a cleanse. I did a 10-day detox during COVID. Everybody was eating, eating. I said, okay, I'm going to do the opposite. I'm going to go and I'm going to clean. I'm going to steam. I'm going to go back to my meditation practice. I'm going to get myself much more centered during all of this because I need to be at the best that I can be. I need to get to the gym. I need it in my gym at home. I need to start doing much, much more self-love. I need to start reading about things that I need to be interested in lots more of what's going on in the world and be very aware of what is happening. So I think that I took the opportunity all, all, and I became a day trader and I became an amazing cook during this time. I watched more cooking YouTube. I'm now a pizza YOLO. I make dough every Thursday and I make pizzas on Friday and people come over and they have these fantastic pizzas. So, so I have, I've had fun. Um, I've had uh, uh, a lot of work to do. Uh, there's been lots of personal transitions. And the greatest gift of all is I have a 10 year old boy who's just turned 11. And uh, during my career, I've had to travel an awful lot in the last 10 years. Uh, so I got to be with my son every day. And uh, that was something that I, I, I mean, that's the best outcome that I could have asked for. So I'm, I've always loved and he loves and we've always had a closeness, but now it's different. Now it's, it's very affectionate and very loving and doing homework with him, and, you know, all of those things that I wasn't doing enough of and I actually felt guilty about, but now I have an opportunity to, uh, to really spend uh, some really great time with him as well. Excellent. I was just uh, handed a note here and thank you for that. I'm inspired by that. Uh, for me, it's not cooking, and, but I would love to get one of these pizzas. How do I get a Ray pizza? Can you ship them? Can we? No, buy them? no, no, no. You've got to get, by the way, I'm a little bit finicky, but who gets to eat them? So it's, uh, it really is, you have to be invited and you, you, and you are invited. So when we get flying again and moving, you'll come and be, people sit at the bar on Fridays here and there's a very large space and we have an outdoor space too. So I make a lot of pizza on Friday. <laughs> That's all I do, but it's, um, yeah, it's worth coming for. Well, as soon as they let us back into your country, I'm there. Yeah. So, uh, Hopefully yeah. soon. And um, so let's just see here. So we've got some great comments here, and I'm going to go to them. And thank you for the share on the personal piece. I totally resonate with that. I love the detox idea. I should do that. I should do a it's, detox. Well, you, you know what happens is the first three days of detox, you, you, you just like, a, a, like, I don't know, you just want to sleep and you stink and, you know, it's, it's not fun. Um, but day four or five, you have some, just some newborn energy. Um, so, you know, the concept is about reinventing you. That's really right. what it is. It's about taking the opportunity when crises happen. When something comes to an end, you know, um, then, then it's time for you to, to really uh, look at how can I reinvent and, and create a better version of myself versus a worse version of myself. Because a lot of people end up choosing the opposite. You know, they, they end up doing things... Um, to hurt themselves more, to make less of themselves, mentally, physically, and spiritually. So, you know, it is, it's discipline, it's, it's hard work, obviously, but, uh, but the reward is, is immense and well worth, worth the effort. Excellent. All right, so I, uh, let's see here. We've got some questions here. Are there any guidelines for the express themselves dress code? Yeah, we're still working through that, and that's a great question because, you know, um, you know what's going to happen is, is going to, it could end up being you know, highly unregulated would mean that we would, would just allow everything. And I, I think our, our, you know, we trust that the people that, that are with us at the moment uh, in our salons, you know, everyone has their own unique style. Even if we said to people, you, you can wear whatever you wear, I bet you some people are still going to wear black from top to bottom. And, you know, and, uh, you know, we, have, you know, we want them to wear cool sneakers not necessarily the sneaker that they wear to the gym, although those are now cool too. So there isn't, it's hard to dictate um, what fashion is today. And, and I guess 
uh, we are going to have to look at if, if there's anything that we absolutely don't. I mean, open toe slippers, sandals, things like that might be no's, you know, but, um, you know, I think there's a lot of other things there. Uh, we, we, we're going to hope that everyone uh, has the sensibility and we will probably provide some very light guidelines. Well, and it's a work in process, and I think you mentioned it at the beginning, and, um, and we, I appreciate you sharing that as, as it's evolving for you. Uh, Sam Bricado said that uh, we built the salon through subscription, silver card 750, gold card 1500. Um, love to hear how Ray is changing his salons in light of new trends in the salon industry. It's kind of an open-ended question. You've addressed some of that. Is there anything else that you want to mention? So this is a question from Becky. Uh, how else are you changing this in, um, in light of new trends? Uh, when we say new trends, I, I'm not sure I understand, I, other than the things we've been talking about. Um, you know, I, I, I think that you're, you've got to have a point of difference more than anything else, right? So you have to focus on what you're good at and you have to expand on, on what that is. You know, I think that with all the change that's happened, and, and you know, this is, immense change and for many people it's, it's still very difficult to cope with we've had a lot of change happen and um but there's one thing that i don't think has changed at all and i in fact i think it's been enhanced as well i think it's, it's been accelerated is the need or the desire of human beings to be touched by other human beings who have kindness in their heart people who care deeply about other people which is most of the people that gravitate towards this industry are people who care deeply about other people and they have the need to touch, that's to fulfill them and their purpose is to touch other people with kindness and, and to make the, the, the materials that they work with, the skin and the hair, crafted out as best as they can to enhance that person's look and to defy age as much as possible. And that need through COVID, I think, and, 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 and beyond is going to be much more accelerated uh, I think right now we are hindered because people want to touch and they want to do more for the guests. So in some ways we've had to really work hard to overcome that because our big point of difference at Chevelle was our service experience, the way in which we touch people with kindness, the way in which we cared about everyone's satisfaction was paramount to us. We, you know, our mission statement is, you know, we're proud to care. And, and so um, that's been very challenging for us. But uh, prior to that, we were working on, um, how to enhance the shampoo experience. We were looking at something that was so, you know, basic and, and rudimentary. We were looking at, you know, private room shampoos and different music and blankets on the laps and eye covers and things that would make it more of a cocooning type of experience and that they could, you know, stay there longer and obviously the bed would be more comfortable to buy on. So that, those are the kinds of things we, we'll continue to pursue along with, of course, um, you know, we have five drivers to a successful business, and one of them is a feeder system. Without a feeder system, we, we can't, and especially now more than ever. So we do have quite a bit of focus on, uh, on our feeder system and uh, uh, incorporating much more. We're actually we're gonna, we're doing, we're in the process of building a boot camp. So we will have somewhere in the neighborhood of about 10 people in that boot camp, which is an accelerated program to get them on the floor. So these are all people who have licenses, who come out of school, and we're gonna accelerate their, their growth. And that will probably lead to something more permanent as well. And that YTS, which is our young talent uh, salon. And, and uh, we're, we're working on, on that, I think. Uh, by the way, a lot of our growth pre-COVID was coming at the lower price point of the YTS. It wasn't coming at the master's level. You know? So that price point was um, in our market, it was, uh, I think it was $40 and uh, where we weren't seeing any growth was obviously 85 to 125. We weren't seeing any growth at all. In fact, even very, very subtle declines in that level. But, you know, if we had more people at the $45 price point, uh, we would fill those chairs. So that there, is a, there are a lot of consumers out there that want value. Um, they just don't necessarily have as much money uh, to pay for it. And that's always been part of the problem with the business model itself is charging enough for your services. So. Uh, but we do see um, opportunity um, certainly at that, at that level as well. I love you mentioned human touch. And, uh, you know, again, going into the pandemic, I, I was at a presentation last fall and it's the word being human centered, the word human 
just keeps emerging. And I think it's because of artificial intelligence and not really knowing what's real anymore. And the whole human centered approach, uh, I think the beauty industry demonstrates massive leadership to other industries. Uh, last year, Ray, I did a bunch of presentations with Merrill Lynch and I was so proud to be able to talk about the beauty industry and the, what I learned from it and the power of touch. And I think the salon industry actually would be elevated um, as we go into the future, as that place where touch is allowed, it's appropriate, it's wonderful. And um, so I'm really inspired by how the salon industry has also uh, represented themselves during the pandemic. It's amazing. So, well, we and SPA, excuse me. All right, Ray, you are super generous with your time. Uh, we're going to award you the light bulb, uh, the million dollar idea. Okay, there's a million dollars. Okay for you. Love that. So now we've got to so figure much. out how to get up to Canada. So um, uh, as is the true form here, uh, first of all, if you have any final words, and then we're going to wrap up your segment. So any final words to the group? Yeah, I think when the future first arrives, you know, it's, uh, it, most of us don't even, don't even recognize it. And so it's about really recognizing it sooner, faster, get there quicker, fail faster. When you fail and you know you're failing, you know, get out of it quicker. And don't get locked into the past, man. Don't, don't become a prisoner of what you thought was. You know, be open to everything that's coming. And, um, and just you know, keep your mind young and curious. But Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. So yeah, let's- Thank uh, you. Everybody, let's give Ray a virtual applause here. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for spending time with me today. I really appreciate it.